So what I have left, the VHD option. If we want to add a fixed VHD footer and I'll call it a day and have a beer and have a good night. So <laughs> it's like 6 p.m. already. All right, let's do V or VHD. Add a fixed virtual hard disk footer to the disk image. We'll also change the suffix to dot VHD. I may split these videos up because I'm going, I might go two and a half, three hours here. I'm, I might split these up, the flags, into two videos. Just if I have a weird ending or don't have an ending to this one, you'll know why or it's changed with the other one. Anyway, if they end weird and I'm just really tired in the middle of, or the start of a second video, that's because I split them up, <laughs> just in case. Not that it matters. My mind is willing, my body is spongy and weak, or whatever the Zat Brannigan quote was. <laughs> uh, yeah, so we'll do that. If we want to natively mount on Windows, we can do that. So how do we do this? I plus, well, we'll automatically do that. Let's say, Options VHD. Do we have a boolean for that? We probably don't. I do have a boolean for that. Never mind. That's cool. We'll just do that. That's easy enough. We also have to handle that down here. Add a virtual hard disk footer. We can natively mount in Windows, or this is like an extra. I mean, you don't have to watch at this point. We don't need to add anything else to the disk image. This is just an extra, and I thought it was cool. And I had a friend ask me if I wanted to do this because it would allow better mounting on Windows and better use with tools like VirtualBox and things that don't like a .img file. Maybe they like a .vhd better. So this is like a, an external request, but it's pretty cool to just look up and add a simple thing. So I like being able to do that if I can. So we'll add that. Mm, so I might want to add that uh, before we print the info out. But after we get the sizes, so we know how big it is, because it will add 512 bytes to the size and it will change the name. So yeah, that's, I'll do that here. So let's add a thing, add VHD footer. We'll say, well, it'll be a fixed VHD. Fixed VHD footer to the image and the image name is a global variable so I'll just pass the image in and we'll do that. This should always succeed. I don't think I'll add a boolean to that but maybe I will later. Uh, okay. Get rid of the green there. Thank you. No Seth Green right now. I like him though. I liked him as Joker in Mass Effect. So let's see, what are we gonna add to here? We need like a type def for that. A VHD footer struct, so I'm going to add that. Then I'll say fill out VHD footer info and we'll write it to the file. Of course, write to end of file. So let's seek our image zero seek end. And I'll F write, uh, we'll say we have a VHD struct. I'll make this in a second. We'll have a VHD struct. And we'll do one, we'll do size of VHD, write it to the image, and there we go. So our image size would be plus 512 at this point as well plus equal size of, and we'll have a VHD struct there. Okay. So what is a VHD? What is a virtual hard disk footer? I'm glad you asked, because I'm glad I remembered. I had a Wikipedia page open, VHD file format, virtual hard disk, it's by Microsoft. It's basically a, for a fixed VHD, the simplest version, it's 512 bytes. We can just write a struct for that, although it is all in big Indian. So maybe just byte arrays in, inside the struct, but, it's uh, 512 bytes for a fixed VHD footer specifically that says basically what is the creation info for this virtual hard disk and who made it and how big is it, you know, yada yada. Basically that's all it is. But it's a standard by Microsoft. 
If you want the spec that I'm going to write, not VHDX, because that's more complicated, but just the basic one, we can go to the virtual hard disk image format specification. Assuming the web archive loads, this looks buggy, but that's just how it loads with these links and stuff. But if we go down and specification download, I, the register page probably doesn't work. So just download without registering. That's fine. It gives you a file. And the file is this spec document here. So, all right, the file is that specification document there. I have that under Alpine, so you're not blinded by the browser anymore. <laughs> Um, I did have it open there, but I closed it earlier. So let's open that here. Um, where did I have it? Programming YouTube, probably. Yeah. Well, I still have it locked, but I'll try to open it again. And I didn't want to do that. Put it in the background, please. All right. Can I close this window? Thank you. Uh, we'll try to recover it. I know you can't read the text. It's super tiny for me as well. But okay, just because I changed the colors earlier, so I had to save that. Virtual hard disk image format specification. It just goes over everything here. Sector length is always 500 to a byte, so I'm just gonna add that much to the end of the disk. I'm gonna write a fixed VHD footer, fixed hard disk image, which only works up to two gigs in size. So we'll probably wanna add a check for that. If we want a dynamic hard disk, image, we would have a copy at the start as well as the end, as well as a header for different blocks allocated for the image. A differencing disk is a little different still, but if we just want the common thing common to all of them, and the only thing you need for a fixed VHD, we just need this footer right here. So we'll do that, and I'll make sure it's valid under Windows so that we can natively mount it. We don't need another tool. Even though I like OSF mount and other tools, we don't need one if we make a valid VHD here. 511, we'll do 512 bytes, but I'm just gonna add these things as a type def struct, right? As a VHD, VHD struct at the top under our options thing or above it. Um, common virtual hard disk footer. So we'll say for a fixed VHD. All right, and we'll do it packed because it needs to be exactly 512 bytes. But I will fill out the fields for this and I'll fill out the fields for this and get back to you in one second. I'm just going to fill out these values. The only thing to note here, if it says, probably says above, maybe. Okay, yeah, the only thing to note here is that all values are stored in network byte order. So all values are big Indian. So we'll have to either do byte swapping or make sure that we write them in big Indian, not little Indian order, or it won't work. But all reserve values are zero. All values are big Indian. So what I'm going to do for these is probably, uh, probably just use byte arrays. <laughs> so an array of eight bytes, for example, for the cookie, maybe an array of four bytes for features. Otherwise, we have to worry about byte swapping and stuff. And I'm lazy. So it's not the best way of doing things. It adds more work and more code, but I'm lazy, so I'll do that. Okay, so I'll see you in one second. All right, so I got the struct definition laid out here. Just did byte arrays for all these, which is bad. As I said, I'm lazy or otherwise a bad programmer. We use byte arrays because all these are going to be network byte order, big Indian, and other words. So where I go to write this, we'll fill out values. The only difference is it said 16 in the footer here for the unique ID, wherever my cursor is. It doesn't matter, does it? Unique ID, right? This says 16 bytes, but if we go down here and look at where that is defined, every hard disk has a unique ID. This is a UUID, and we have that as a GUID. So that doesn't necessarily need to be big Indian. It'll be kind of mixed for Microsoft. So this will be uh, the regular GUID value we know and love. Okay, so I'll fill out data here. Just fill that out there. I should make a macro to do this and not do all this, but 
that's fine. Like I said, I'm a bad programmer, so okay. <laughs> Needs a dot for all these. Okay, um, cookie specifically, what does that need to be? It needs to be Connectix for Microsoft to actually think it's it's useful and mount it. So you probably don't need this on Linux, but Microsoft, like Windows 10, Windows 11, it, it will look for this specific string. Otherwise, it'll say it's wrong or invalid or something, even if other tools and things work. Uh, Windows OS itself, I think, only allows this as the unique string, because that was originally who made this spec for or with Microsoft. So Connectix was a company. But we'll do that here. Since we have byte arrays, we can just write that as a string. And yeah, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. That'll work. Just make sure that's an array. Maybe I'll just bring this on the screen. That would be easier, wouldn't it? <laughs> can I go to the left? Yeah, there we go. Okay, features flag. This is a bit field to indicate feature support. Let's say no features enabled. That sounds good to me. I like no features enabled. Let's go down. S, semicolon, make a colon. Yeah. Okay, the version field, file format version. The least significant two bytes are minor. This must match the file format. For the current spec, this field must be initialized to this value. Okay, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0. Easy enough. Data offset holds the absolute byte offset from the beginning of the file to the next structure. For fixed disks specifically, this field should be set to Fs. So the issue here, because I've had bugs with this before, this has a 32-bit number of Fs. It has eight Fs. But the data offset here is eight bytes. And on modern Windows version, 64-bit, it's gonna look for eight bytes of Fs to equal negative one, not four bytes. So I think that's just a bug in the spec because it's looking for a value of negative one, not, you know, whatever the 32-bit limit is, <laughs> four gig. It's not looking for four gig, it's looking for negative one. So just keep that in mind, which also means we don't really need to make this, we don't need to make them all bytes, uh, arrays then. This could be, uh, sorry, I keep going back and forth. This could just be a 64 bit, right? Cause it's eight bytes and it's all Fs, that's fine. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Look at all those Fs. All right, timestamp. This stores creation time of a hard disk image, number of seconds since January 1st, 2000. And it's in big Indian, so I might fill out values down below if I fill these out. You know, like, um, I need a timestamp, a time T value, right? Let's have, let's have time U32. And let's just do time null. And that'll be the value since 1970. So we need to like subtract 30 years or we can find on the internet, I've done this before, not blind me. Let's get translate Unix uh, epic to year 2000. I know there's like stack overflow posts and stuff. It's this one because I've clicked on it. <laughs> we can just get the, the the value for January 1st, 2000, and we can subtract that, right, from the value from 1970, and that'll get the time since 2000. So that's that's fine. Subtract the epic 30 years in the future, and we'll get the right one there. So 94668480. So 994668480. Oh, oh. Yeah, okay. So Unix, Epic, so time timestamp, number of seconds since 1, 1, 2000. We'll say Unix Epic for 1, 1, 2000 is this. Subtract this value from uh, epic one one nineteen seventy translate to correct timestamp. 
because people got to be different. Why not? They got to have different values. So this is probably bigger than you went 32, but I mean, that's, that's what I got here. So, oh, well, we'll subtract that. This is less than 4 billion, right? It's 946 million. Yeah. So we're good. That'll fit in the UN32. All right. So how do we translate that? We can do zero, one, two, three, four. Zero, one, two, three. So this is a bad way of doing it, like I said, but we can just take the bytes and, you know, make them big Indian from little Indian doing a byte swap function, right? So the lowest eight bits will be the top eight bits here, for example. And we can just do that like, uh, like this. We can end with FF if we need to, we might not need to. It's probably fine. So we'll do 16, eight and zero. We can neither, well, we can just not do anything really. Okay, bad way of doing this. Of course, it's extra code because I don't write native little Indian things, but that's all right. Creator application should document application created the hard disk, single byte character set. So let's say, uh, queso fuego image creator, that's fine. Or UEFI GPT image creator. It's out oh, in QFIC. People will wonder what that means. That's fine. <laughs> it's created by Microsoft VPC. This doesn't matter. The only thing that really matters for modern Windows to recognize this and mount it is going to be this connectic string and the data offset. The other things really don't really matter. Maybe even the version, but typically the other things, they really, they really don't matter. So in my experience, Creator version, I'm just going to make it say version one like this version up here. Okay, creator OS, Windows or Mac, I, I mean, I'm not using either one. So I'm going to say it's going to be my OS. That's the one that's going to do it. It's mine. It's not yours. Original size is the size of the hard disk in bytes. From the perspective of the virtual machine at creation time and the current, those will be the same for our disk. And we have the image size. How big are these though? Original and current are all, yeah, they're both eight bytes. So, okay. Um, so I'll have to do this for that. Not great, but that's okay. Say original size zero, uh, 7p. One, two, three, four, five, six, and seven. And that'll be our image size. Our original image size, which is gonna be um, added on by 512 bytes. Does it count the size of this footer as part of that? I don't know. That's a good question. I don't think it does because the footer is added on to the end. So it's probably just image size. And then I'm adding after that. Yeah, it's probably just, yeah, that's probably all right. I don't count the size of the footer in there. We'll see. <laughs> we'll see what happens. So what are, what are, the, what would the top bytes be? It'd be 56 to 63, right? Also need to add semicolons to these. All right, image size there. I don't know why I lay this out when I just want to copy like this value first, so I shouldn't stop doing that. Um, 7p. And then we need eight less than that, which would be 48. We'll have 40, we'll have 32, we'll have 24, 16, eight and zero. All right, zero to seven, okay. And then I'll also set the creator size. What was it? Current size, not creator. Current size is going to be that original size. Okay. Disk geometry. This stores the cylinder head and sector per track. 
Um, the pseudocode used to determine can be found in the appendix. Okay, so we'll fill that out from their code example in the appendix. Taken from um, whatever the name of this document is. <laughs> Okay, disk type will be a fixed hard disk. That will be two, because that's what I'm doing. I'm not doing differencing, I'm not doing dynamic. It's not reserved, it's not none. We'll just do two. Is that a, is that a big field? Disk type, yeah, okay. And that needs to be the first byte, because it's big Indian. I don't necessarily need to fill out the other bytes because of how uh, array yeah, because of how compound literals and initialization works for this. But yeah, so two will be the top byte, so it's two. I think that'll work. Check some. If the verification fails. Pseudocode for that is found as well. Okay. We'll do that. What do we have? Unique ID needs to be a GUID. We have a function for that. It's a new GUID. That's easy enough. Saved state. One byte flag that describes whether it's saved. If it is in the saved state, the value is set to one. Not be performed. I guess we'll do zero. It's not in a saved state. Although it is, but whatever. We'll set it to zero. And reserved to zero. Okay. Not bad. Not bad at all. We're not worried about dynamic or differencing. Don't worry about it. Don't need to worry about it. Don't need to worry about it. Don't need to worry about it. Where is, there we go, CHS. Let's have some data here. So disk geometry is four bytes. So we'll use UNT32s for this. That's what I'll do. And I'm just gonna, basically, I'm just gonna copy this code over here. So I'll see you in a second when I finish that. All right, so I got just this code sort of copied over from what they had. Um, I did add this total sectors line. That's gonna be my image size and LBAs. Um, note that they mentioned the disk sector had to be 512 bytes. So I added a to-do down here where we have a VHD option. I'm just going to disallow if LBA size is greater than 512. I'm not going to allow that. So, because <laughs> the spec itself, it, this might not be true in the modern day, but that's the last specification I have for a fixed VHD. So I have to assume it only allows 512, I guess. It probably allows more, but whatever. Neither here nor there. Just wanted to uh, let you know that. Oh, all right. Okay. So let's go back to where I was, add fixed VHD footer. All right, so this code I just copied from the spec, that's all I did. That's all this is, I just copied it verbatim. <laughs> so we still have to fill out the value though. And the disk geometry value, is going to be the cylinder in the first two bytes, the head in the next byte, the sectors per track in the next byte. So one, two, three, four, big Indian, cylinder's the first two, sectors per track is the last one. So we can fill that out in the disk geometry. Zero is gonna be cylinders, shift left by, I guess eight, well, it's only gonna be two bytes. So really cylinders can only be two bytes, I guess. I should do that. I made them all UNT32 because <laughs> the sector was going to be. Well, 
We'll have cylinders be there. Heads is going to be uint 8t. I suppose. Sectors per track. Um, I guess that's what I'll use, right? Sectors per track cylinder. That's going to be limited to 31 or 63 or 17 or 255. So that'll actually be a UN8T as well. Cylinder times heads, though, that'll be a, maybe a big value. So probably not good making these things like this, but that's how I'm doing it. <laughs> That way I know cylinders is limited to 16 bit and we can do shift left by eight for the top byte, the lowest eight bits, because big Indian here, I suppose. This is how it works, right? Hopefully this is how it works, I don't know. I'm assuming this is how you convert little to big Indian. Hopefully it's correct. But the first two bytes are cylinders. Cylinder two bytes, cylinders, um, heads one byte, sectors per track one byte. Okay. Two, three, four. Okay, so hopefully that works. I suppose if they're too large, they're too large, but they should be well within limits because we have code to do that. And then all we need is the checksum. So the checksum's at the end of the VHD spec. It just has drive footer checksum. I guess I'll move that back again. <laughs> we can copy that verbatim here. So the checksum is going to be, what, 32 bytes, right? Just making sure, yeah, 32, 32 bits, not, not byte. I'll have a value here. Have an ultimate checksum, and we'll have VHD checksum, of course, zero, one, two, and three. Similar to how we're doing the other stuff. Don't need it there. So how do we fill that out? So checksum will start at zero, that's fine. Drive footer dot checksum, that's the VHD checksum, that's going to be already zero, so we don't have to worry about that. Where did I just go? Go back to where I was. All right, we don't have to worry about that. So four. We'll have 32t counter, counter equals zero, counter less than the size, so size of VHD, counter plus plus. We're just adding up all the bytes, check sum plus equal VHD offset by counter. So let's have it actually be, well, this will be fine. Um, let's do this, u and 8t, VHD pointer equals UNAT pointer. We'll make this a pointer. UNAT pointer to VHD. I guess to the address of VHD. Yeah, I'll have the address of it. And we'll do VHDP offset by the counter. There we go. And then the checksum is going to be not that value. So we'll do not equal checksum. Okay. Invert all the bits at the end there. Okay. Let's send that back to the shadow realm so we don't have to look at it and be blinded. So I'll just do that. We'll get a, a byte pointer to the, the hard disk footer we're making, and we'll just go off every byte in that and add them up for a simple checksum, invert all the bits, and set those according to that result. And that's a VHD footer. Now, hopefully that works. I mean, I'll test. I'll check in Windows here. But hopefully that works, and we have a bunch of issues because I missed something. Uh, something not a structure or union. Request for member in something not a structure or union. Interesting. 
Excess Elements and Scalar Initializer. Because I changed something, probably. The data offset is that. That's correct. Timestamp, did I make it just the UNT32? I made it UNT4. I don't know what it means. What is the issue? Some of these things don't need to be initializers. I guess unique ID, this is different, but I did make that different. Oh, this doesn't need to be four, my bad. This needs to be just just the regular GUID. Don't don't make that an array, that was a mistake. Hopefully you caught that before I did. Still have a lot of issues though. Oh, since I'm using a pointer, that's true. I might have missed some semicolons somewhere in here. That timestamp has four bytes though, I don't know what the issue is with that, but anyway. Checksum in something not a structure or union. I don't know why it says that. VHD undeclared. That's VHD for you. Little case, little lowercase VHD. Um, image size plus size of, that should be okay though. I, that's a type def struct. Oh no, I need to put that at the end. Duh, VHD. That's the name of it, not up here. Jeez, man. Yeah, that fixes a whole lot of warning, doesn't it? It has to know what the name is, you know, being defined for. Duh. Races around scalar initializer save state. That's true. 1187. Save state is a single byte. Let's make that sucker a zero. Current size equal original size, I cannot do that. That's lame, okay. I mean, I could mem set it, right? By, by that I mean copy. They're not gonna be in the same location. Uh, okay, statement with no effect. What's wrong with that? It not equals itself. I mean, it said to do that. I guess I need to check sum equals not check sum. Would that be the way to do that? That's the way to do it. That's the way you do it. Money for nothing and your compiler error bugs for free. Money for nothing. Image name, I did not change the name. That's true. Uh, but it should have added an extra 500 bytes to it. I don't know if that shows up on here. It probably does. Yeah, it says it's a mismatch. <laughs> uh, of course it does. We do need to change the name of the image. I will do that. Because I wrote to the end of it here. Image size plus equal size of. Don't expect your other tools to work, even if they will be valid, because the VHD is going to mess with the end of it. But this is just an extra little thing. Well, add change, phd suffix uh, on image name. Yeah, that's fine. Change to, to image name doesn't make sense. We'll just say add to image name. So let's have character dot position will be uh, string r character image name dot, if not dot position, how big is the image name? Actually, I might have to allocate more data for that. Now that's lame. That's just a character pointer. Hmm. Go back to where I was, please. You don't want to do that? Okay. There we go, right here. <laughs> we just want to add on to the end there. Let's have a buffer. Let's malloc or c alloc is what I usually like to do. String length image name plus three, just in case. Just in case. Well, plus four for the null byte on the end too, actually. We'll do that. 
And let's copy into buffer image name. Okay, we'll get a dot position there. If there isn't one, then we just have a plain name without an extension. All I'm going to do is string cat onto buffer dot VHD. Of course, we can do string in cat even for this. Do three or four, I guess, because it's going to be four bytes. Okay, else we'll change wherever the extension is to the dot position. We'll have it go to the dot position. Let's do this within the buffer because we put the image name into there. So from that position to the end, which is where the dot is, um, we'll do this thing. Dot VHD4. So that'll rename the image if we move it back. So let's do image name equals buffer. We allocated that. We'll have to free that at the end, I'm sure. But that's okay. Let's have if options dot VHD will free image name. Okay. File miscellaneous cleanup. So, because we'll have allocated a buffer that and set it to that buffer, so we need to free that buffer at the end of this. Might, might as well if it gets there. Okay, so we should add a VHD suffix if it's a plain name or if it has an extension, we'll replace it with this. Hopefully, actually, I'll do string copy so I know it replaces it and ends the thing with a null afterwards. Yeah, if it's the end of the file and it's no extension, we'll just add VHD onto the end. Okay. Oh, we don't like it. Too many arguments, because I didn't do string in copy. String in cat specify bound for equals source length. You're going to deal with it, dude. You're just going to deal with it. Uh, I don't want to do size of buff, because it's the size of the other thing. You know what? Whatever. String cat. I know it's going to work, because I allocated four extra bytes. <laughs> Not even going to worry about it. Which is not what you want to do, that's that's bad, but okay. Made it, it's okay, so let's write VHD, okay. Image name test.vhd. There we go. I could add some info to it as well. You could say like add added VHD footer or something. Yeah, I'll do that. All right, image name, test.vhd, OBA size. So all of that is okay. So what I'm gonna do is copy that over to my host just to check that Windows can actually mount it and look at the data therein. All right, so let's do that. That's my test.image. We don't have that test.vhd that is. Oh, it didn't. You know what, no, I'm not gonna do that. Because it renamed it, but it opened the file. Mm, when does it open the image? It opens it here. All right, let's do that after this point. <laughs> after the VHD, we'll open it here because it will have that new name. And then we'll check. Let me just get rid of this stuff as well. All dot VHD, okay. Image undeclared, well, of course it is. Oh, but we have to do it before here, ooh. Mm. So image is undeclared. Um, no, I can re-put it down here, okay. Let's open the image after the VHD, but I'm just going to call it image, right? And at the top of main, I'll have an image and an FP. Okay. There we go, then it's all hunky-dory, dash V or dash dash V, and it doesn't work segmentation fault. <laughs> See, why do you do this to me? File pointer image. Because it's not open when we do add VHD, that's true. 
I, it needs to have a new name. Like my whole deal with this is that it, the the name needs to change. You know what I mean? Let's do that. Let's add that first. Oh, this is annoying. I'm going to have an else. Let's do that. Let's have an else. So I don't have to think about it. We'll have an else, right? And I'll just copy this. Because I'm a bad person. And that's what I do. And we'll open it there. Else, we'll open it here. Open non-VHD image. You know, terrible code. It's duplicated. Oh, well. As the great Martin Fowler said, if you do it three, three times, thrice, then you can abstract it out. But VHD works now. Dot VHD. We don't have anything there. Let's do ls-l test all. So VHD should be 512 bytes more. It is not. Oh, because of course it's not. Um, because I probably didn't write the data to it. Right? Did I not write the data to it? Did I not write? I wrote to the end of the image right here. Size of VHD to the image. What's going on, dude? Oh. Image size plus equal. I did say plus equal at the end, but because I added that size. Yeah, add fixed VHD footer, increase, okay. I F seek to the end of the image and then I write more data to the image. That is how this works, right? <laughs> so it should be 512 bytes larger according to the data I filled out here, but they're the same size. That's not good. That means I have an error where I'm writing this stuff, right? Oh, make. Okay, let's, let's write a normal one and write a VHD. They're the same size. Yeah, that's not good. See, the VHD should be 512 bytes larger. That's what I'm not getting. If I seek to the end of this file and it's this big and I write 512 bytes, right, shouldn't it be larger? Of course, the other things are probably, um, uh, getting larger than that. Uh, I write to the end with the GPT headers as well, don't I? So that's probably not good. Right, when do I write the secondary table? Don't I go to the end of the image here? For image size and OBAs minus one? Yeah. Okay. So that would make the same with both, maybe. Um, go to the bottom. Go to where I'm adding the VHD. I'm just doing this completely wrong. Let's add the VHD like all the way at the end, maybe. And then that, that way I wouldn't have to do this other stuff. But the image name would be different. I'll do an end diff right here. I know what I'm doing. Then I don't have to open it again. All right, we'll just have it opened elsewise. And we can do this stuff at the end. Right, we'll rename it. That's fine. We'll open it normally. At the end, after we add everything, then we'll add the VHD footer, which should add after the, D the GPTs, the secondary GPT, which would have overwritten it before. And we can free the name. I can add this as the initial GPT check or a VHD check as well. Uh, under here. Yeah, add that check. If it's correct, then we'll go on. But at the end where I add it, we'll add it and we'll increase the size. Um, I won't do that. I'll just say added, added VHD footer. 
I don't know if that'll make too much of a difference. It should, maybe. It'll be 36 meg plus 512. It now added it at the end. Uh, hey, there we go. Okay, yeah. And then it added 512 after that point. Add it at the end. That's all you have to do. Switcher, do a switcheroo, switch it around there. That works. Okay. Now I'm going <laughs> to send this over to my host machine and uh, we'll see if Windows mounts it and if it's okay. So I'll see you then. Okay, I just SCP'd the file over, got the test VHD here, I did that. So, actually, I mean, I can show what I did, because you're not going to get this local IP. I just did this. I forgot how to send to Windows, so it's forward slash, drive letter, colon, forward slash, path. So I got the VHD here. We should be able to mount it, but I also had... Um, this is an older version of the repo, so I would pay no attention to that. But I also have... Um, scripts to do this stuff so open this with notepad we'll say so i have a powershell script if you don't want to do it manually if you send it the uh, the name of the image that you're going to open if you don't it's it says a default of test.vhd which is what i have but it's going to get that for the input argument or it's going to use that as a default name so it's going to mount that image right it's going to assign a drive letter I'll just assign X by default. It's going to wait if you want to mess with it, and then it's going to unmount, because otherwise it, you know, there's other things that happen there. So you can run these things manually, or you can run the script uh, through PowerShell. Let's just run with PowerShell. Why not? Press Enter. So required privilege isn't held. Okay, so it won't do anything, because I need to do a... Uh, PowerShell here, so I'll just run my terminal as administrator. UEFI image creator, so I have this stuff. So let me take in uh, my test.vhd file. Okay, so just to make sure this is my current one here, this is the current time that I made it, 25th, yeah, okay. Let's run that PowerShell mount, HD PowerShell. The file is corrupted and unreadable. Ooh, that's not good. That means I didn't make it correctly. <laughs> of course, why would I have made it correctly, right? So it didn't mount it, it didn't do anything. Ooh, I mean, I can pass it test.vhd. See if that works any better. Nope. Interesting. Okay, maybe I didn't do the file correctly. Oh, of course. Why would I have done it correctly? This should be what you need. Connectix, data offset. Like that's pretty much all that you need to be lined up and the other stuff should work. Maybe the size wasn't right. Do I have to add 512 bytes to the image size? I can test though. I don't think that matters. All right, 36 meg. Uh, PowerShell, get rid of that. Get rid of that IP info. Oh, I don't have it back up. Um, it's all latest improvement. Actually, let me just grab that file. Test VHD. Oh, we'll replace it. To run everything is admin. It's annoying. Yeah, it's corrupted. That's interesting. It shouldn't be corrupted. Do I have XXD? Uh, no, I should have a length there. Stop after length octets. Yeah, that's fine. Oh, options, and then the file. All 
Uh, actually, I need I need to seek the whole thing. <laughs> oh, so we need this. Okay, so let's seek to this value minus five twelve, which is going to be oh four zero, and it'll just give the length of five twelve. Hopefully, maybe it doesn't. Okay, so yeah, we get the connectic. So that stuff was written okay. It just says that that's not good. Interesting. I know I had like some weird Azure tools. Yeah, because I've done this before. We'll inspect that VHD. This was like a go tool. Um, I did online. I think I have to pass the full path, which is lame. No help talk. Well, I don't want to help, though. I know I've used this before to look at the stuff. I don't remember what I did, though. <laughs> oh, you freaking... Okay, hold on. I'll be back when I figure this out. Sorry for not knowing how to debug my stuff. Okay, guys. All right. <laughs> hey, I figured out the issue. I figured it out. For me, the only thing is, well, data offset, I had all Fs. I changed the negative one. That should be the same, but it is looking for a negative one offset. The only thing I changed, even though I was getting my tools saying the cookie was wrong, is the disk type. I had it as 2.0. Why? I can't tell you why. That would be 20, right? Or maybe it was 02. But anyway, I thought it was big ending, so it had to be 02. It actually has to be 2 in the smallest bytes here. Why? I don't remember. I don't remember. <laughs> like, I guess because it's big ending, this would be like 2 million or whatever, so it needs to be 2 in the... Oh. In the, the final 8 bits here for a fixed disk. The value's 2, not, you know, 2 with a bunch of zeros. That's why. It was a bad type, it was corrupted, it was reserved. I don't have to add the disk, uh, the image size to VHD, don't have to worry about that. I'm pretty sure that's the only thing I changed. Um, help text I still have to do, but I'm gonna do that off camera, so okay. So after changing to do the actual disk type correctly, and just just making sure here this this is still the same. If we write a VHD file, and I'm gonna put that back in my folder, I'm gonna delete that so it shows back up. All right. And it's here. So if I go to PowerShell, I'm in the, I'm in the folder. Um, we have test.vhd. So Azure, actually I have to do inspect and then I have to say what I want to inspect and I have to give a specific path with the path sort of thing there, specifier. And then, hey, it gives me the actual footer if I want to check it with this tool, which I might link to this. It's, it's old, but it works. I think it's built using Go, but it works. It was the only thing I could find to actually inspect the stupid footer values here. But anyway, uh, timestamp, I guess, is not correct. I'm probably doing that wrong. Oh, well. <laughs> Creator version works for 04, host OS type. I mean, that's not right, but whatever. I just gave it uh, my OS for that. I guess the type is wrong. Cylinder head sector, physical virtual fixed. I'm assuming these things are right. I mean, this is right for the ID, but that actually loads it there. So let's see if Windows will mount this. The disk file is corrupted. Okay. Did it mount it anyway? I, I don't know. We can go, it did not. Okay, so does my script still work? All right, does my script still work to mount it? Let's find out. We'll put it in there. Uh, mount VHD. It says it's corrupted and unreadable. Interesting, see it should mount it. I swear I've gotten this to work before. I know I have actually, because this is my old version of this. My old version of this I know works. 
Hopefully it works. So I need to find out what I'm doing differently. Well, I got it to mount though, which is good. <laughs> so I still got a debug, sorry about that. I wanna get it to mount and then I'll know the VHD works, but I know the footer reads correctly now, which is nice. So I gotta work on that. Okay, so for the last and final time, I did figure out my issue. It was with the sizes here. I noticed the virtual size was zero when I was looking at this earlier. I was like, oh, that's not correct. These need to be the same size. So I had the size calculations wrong. I also had the shifts wrong because I didn't remember how to convert from, from big to little Indian. So sorry about that. Yeah, all of these left shifts should have been right shifts. So I was taking the little, the lowest eight bits and moving them up. I, I needed to take the top bits and move them down to shift the bytes from little to big Indian here. Sorry about that. That was me being a, an idiot. Also the original size, I was doing a four, right? I had a four, but these two original current size are eight. I just thought it was 32 bit for some reason. So make sure that's the size of that. Or better yet, we can do size of uh, VHD original size and it'll take that field. So that's fine, that's eight bytes, not four bytes. That would make a lot of sense why that did not work. Um, but everything else was okay. We can seek to the end and write the image, that is all right. Um, I just have to print help text. I'm gonna do that maybe off camera because all I'm really gonna do is, is this pretty much. I'm gonna print F to, well, we could print the standard out. I'll just print F, right? And we'll say like the usage, you know, which will be argv zero options, right? We'll have something like that. And that'll be the image name and then options are gonna be options. So, um, you know, we'd have something like dash V, dash S, VHD, and I put, you know, text for VHD options. That's all I'm gonna do is just write a text thing here for help. But other than that, yeah, sorry I spent so long making the, the dumb VHD working. <laughs> But that does actually work. Um, and if you want to see, again, just because I forgot, if we want to open that VHD script, we can mount it by using this. Get the friendly name, Microsoft Virtual Disk, get the partition, assign it drive letter X, pause, and then I'm just unmounting by removing that access path if you want to run that. Or if you want to check that it actually does mount now. Hold on. Let me make sure I'm not a liar to you, right? Let's mount this. Hey, it says this. Okay, this is correct. It says there's issues. It says that it, it isn't initialized. Use disk management. Create and format hard disk partitions. So we'll have some weird stuff on here, um, which is gonna be where removable disk. No, 36, see? We get a healthy EFI system partition and we have a raw partition on there. So I don't want that, right? I wanna detach that VHD. I want to get rid of that. That just proves that it mounts under Windows, but to assign a drive letter and stuff, if you don't want to use disk part, because it's really annoying, I don't want to use disk part. Um, or going through other menus and things. I did set this mount script to do that. So let me just overwrite this with the latest one here. And I'll go in here, I'm in here, all right. So what that does, if you want to use this on Windows specifically, it'll mount it. It'll say true, just leave it be. It's that little pause script in there. And now if we go through, and we go to our PC, I mounted it, I just gave it X. You might wanna change the drive letter, you know, for your system, but I gave it X. We can go in there, we can go to the EFI system partition, and we can look at whatever we have mounted under that file system. So if you don't want to add files through the command line, or you want more than 10 files, or you wanna do other stuff, I did wanna provide an option to do that, I guess interactively, on Linux and Windows. So on Windows, you'd use the mount VHD script, you go do your stuff, and when you're done, you'll press enter, and it'll unmount it. Yeah, it'll, I got rid of my window, sorry about that. Yeah, it'll unmount it so it's gone after you unmount it. So we can mount it, we can mess with it, and this X, this E is the raw partition, we're not gonna mess with that, because we can't, and then we'll unmount it and it'll unmount the partitions. Okay, so that's on Linux, uh, or that's on Windows. Now on Linux, I have this mount image Linux and unmount image Linux. So what this does, you're gonna have to have network block device. I don't know if I have that. I don't think I do. So let me add that. Actually, I probably do. Yeah, NBD, NBD client. Um, I think you need uh, QEMU NBD as well. 
but I don't have that because that's included. If it's not installed, you may need QEMU utils, depending. I don't, I think mine came with it. I don't have that. Yeah. Anyway, so what this is going to do is select test.image by default. I should do test VHD, but that's fine. You don't need a VHD file to mount under Linux, so that's why it's just test.image. It's going to make a mount point directory. It's going to connect to that with network block device client. It's going to connect through QEMU network block device to the first partition, which is going to be the EFI system partition, zero based. It's going to wait because I had to wait approximately around one second or half a second for it to actually fully mount first. And then I'm going to mount as readable writable. The network block device, the first partition for the first network block device. This is the first device. This is the partition on that device. And I'm going to mount that to that created mount point. If you use a uh, sudo super user do instead of do as, please change these. I'm just assuming do as here. And then you can mount and mess with the file system there. So if I run uh, mount image Linux, it's a raw format. I didn't set the format. Uh, mounting failed invalid argument. Nice, because I don't have test.image. I got rid of it, right? Yeah. So that's my bad. So actually, I do have errors there. You're going to want to make sure uh, stuff, are, yeah. Make sure that stuff uh, works there, but that's that's all right. So if I run by default and we make the regular image, then that should work because I didn't give it the file name. If I had given this the file name, test.vhd, that would have worked. But anyway, by default, it'll use test.image. We can give it the name as well. Apparently, it really doesn't like me today. Man, I'm having a bunch of issues. Uh, failed to set NBD socket. Invalid argument. This has worked before. I know it has. Um, okay, so I can't tell you why that doesn't work. Because it has worked in the past, but all I'm doing for unmounting is doing that in reverse. Unmount NBD. Remove it. Yeah, so I'm disconnecting, removing it, and disconnecting, and removing it. So, yeah, I don't know why... I have the issue. Can't unmount mount P1. Invalid argument. Okay, so the mount point is wrong. Which uh, makes no sense. All right, so I finally got it working. It was nothing in my programming at all. It was with my inability to know how to mount things under Linux. I don't know why I didn't have this. I didn't need it before for some reason, or I had other things to auto detect file systems. I don't know. I don't really know. Maybe I had different packages in the past, but if we give it a file system type of VFAT for mount, it does work. I don't know if you'll need DOS FS tools or other things. I don't have them currently installed because I removed it, but it does work with that. We can make that. We can write an image. We can mount that image. And it just works. And now if we look under mount P1, hey, we have the EFI. We have the boot. And we have the disk image. And we can, you know, do whatever we want with that. So, you can cat it out and everything. So that works. Hey. You can do unmount when you're done messing with that as well. So we have ways to natively mount and unmount under Linux if you have network block device support and everything. Under Windows, natively with a VHD specifically, Linux doesn't need the VHD specifically. It can just do the regular image because it detects the file system if I mount it as that file system. I just forgot how mount worked, so yeah. I'll probably split up these flags videos because this is going to be like three and a half, four hours of me, you know, messing around <laughs> and not getting anything done and failing. So I'll probably split it up into two videos, maybe a couple hours each. We'll see. Try to edit it down less than that, but we'll we'll find out. But ultimately, I have a tool made now, and maybe you do if you hopefully followed along for the most part in the last couple of videos. But if not, you know, the, the code's out there, and that is all right. So status, untracked files, I did add the kernel. And I'm going to add this as a commit here. So the whole point is that we can have stuff uh, work. to have like a boot x64 EFI in here, and we can just do write, and it'll write that automatically to the EFI system partition. We can have that disk image available if we want to write an installer later, 
And we can load and boot QEMU if you want, and it'll boot automatically. And it'll say, hello, EFI world. If I zoom in and not zoom out, I could do full screen, but it'll probably stop. So anyway, that just makes sure that works. We have a tool that we can do a one-liner and write, and it'll make stuff, so that's nice. And we can mount VHDs under Windows, we can mount whatever image under Linux, we have NVD installed, so we're good. That is my That was my ultimate goal for this project, for this GPT image creator. I did everything I set out to do. I actually did more than the last few iterations of the image as far as adding directories to the ESP and multiple files at once. Potentially, it may still be buggy. Um, I will add the help text, I'll update the repo, and where will we go from here? Alright, this will be kind of an extra little part on the end, or an addendum, if you will, to the GPT disk image videos. Probably just slide it as the ending part before we go on to the EFI applications proper, but I had a couple of commits that I've done since making all the flags. I just wanted to go over those briefly. I didn't type them up in recording because it's just separate scattered things, so that would have been this one where I left off. Yeah, the command line arguments and all that, so. All right, just other than other than changing the name, that's not too much. Add some other things for actually adding files to the ESP that weren't in only the local directory, but for outside of the local directory. So I'll try and get these. I'm not sure the best way to do this. Maybe I'll pull stuff up here and this will be the thing. Maybe it'd be easier looking at it, right? <laughs> so in the options struct, no, I can't. There's no... GUI to separate the sidebar, make it bigger or smaller, that, that kind of sucks here, but oh well. Uh, some things are better, some things are worse, uh, that's just life. But okay, in the options struct, I did add an array, or well, a pointer to a pointer, it will be an array of file pointers for the ESP files, in addition to the num ESP file paths and that thing there. So, where I use this in git ops, whatever I called it, I didn't call it that, separated with a, an underscore. Where I'm adding the ESP files. I'm allocating, I just said max files is 10, so I think I changed that from a magic number as well, but I'm just allocating overall about 10 file pointers there. Uh, am I getting the files in here? I believe I am. Somewhere. <laughs> yeah, okay. So we're still getting the paths, making sure they end with the slash, and we're still concatenating them, but before I'm concatenating, I added to get the file pointer for that file. So for that specific index into the array where we're adding the file path, I'm also gonna add to that file's array by opening the file for reading, just checking if it's there. If it's not there, we cannot open the file, but I'm just opening it there so that we have it for later. And at the bottom under main, where we're adding the ESP files, if the options num ESP file paths is there, then I know we have files to add. So I'm adding all of those to the ESP by passing a new parameter to the add path to ESP function. I'm passing that, that file in the array that was added from the git ops function. And then I'm also making sure that I'm closing that out when I'm done with it and freeing the overall array when we're done. So for add path and file to ESP, those changed a little bit. Wherever this function is being called, I'm passing a new file pointer parameter. And if we didn't find the file in the directory we're searching for, we're gonna add that file. I'm passing it to add file to ESP. So just added that as a new parameter. Uh, in addition, the file paths were ended on the command line with a slash, and they don't need to be for the actual file at the end of the path. I wanted to get rid of that slash visually, so I'm ending that here. So that was just a visual bug. It would add the file okay to the ESP, but it would end the, the name visually on the command line with the slash, and we don't... It, that's not too clear, so that just prevents that from happening there. But the other changes to add file to ESP, where I'm taking in this new file that we're adding to the image, this new parameter here. Okay, so for this new file parameter we're adding here, where I'm getting the size of the file, you know, I'm going to fseq to it. Before it might have said new file and I got a file here at runtime, but here we're passing it in, we don't have to do that. So I'm just getting the size of the file here, fseq into the end, getting the size, rewinding. And this is all just for this passed in file pointer. 
And later on when I'm adding the file data, if we're adding it and it's not a directory, then I'm allocating a buffer still for the OBA size and I'm reading from that file that we passed in instead. So that file data will be added to the ESP and it can be added from wherever in the local, in your local directory system. It doesn't have to be where this write GPT program is, it can be elsewhere. So that was like one of the major changes I did recently since the, uh, since the flags videos were done. So what we can do, make it if it's not made yet, we can add files to the ESP, which I think I called AE, and I need files, yep. So let's say we have currently, I don't have a boot x64 EFI file, right? Just for example, so if I write something and we run keymu, it's not, it'll boot into the EFI shell, right? We don't have an application that's being booted here, but maybe you don't want to store that in your local directory here, you want it somewhere else. So, I have my UEFI dev folder, EFI.c, inside of there I have a boot x64, so what I can do is I can write this, we'll add ESP files, and I'll add under EFI boot, that folder path, I wanna add my boot x64 EFI file. Well now we can do this, and this is in another directory. Then we go through and add it, it'll add it to the EFI system partition, it'll add the image file. And now if we do keymu, it should boot up automatically, yeah. And this is just the test thing I was doing, so sneak peek at up upcoming stuff, I suppose, <laughs> for things that I was messing with. But all right, so we can add outside the directory, we can add other files as well. Maybe we wanna add a new test folder and we want to add uh, some other stuff here. I'll just, maybe I'll add the make file for there, for example, <laughs> but we can add outside of there. And then under EFI boot, we can add some other file just to test that it actually adds these things. I'll just add the C file that's gonna be in there. So it should add both of those under a new directory test and there. And if we run Kimu, we should see that in the local file system here in the EFI shell. It goes, there we go. So I have EFI, we have that test folder inside of test, I have that make file. And that's just, you know, the stuff I did for the EFI applications. And elsewhere we have EFI, and then we have boots, and under there I have the EFI.c file. So it, it does add multiple files now, and it adds them from other directories, so that's pretty good. Um, but again, anywhere that we call this add, add path to ESP, we're gonna have to add an additional file pointer there. We're gonna have to add an additional file pointer to the calls. So for instance, when I add the disk when I add the disk image info file and we get the file pointer, this I think has changed as well since what it used to be. I'm opening it and if it does exist, we're gonna close it and I'm gonna open it again for reading. So I wrote the disk image info, I closed it, I opened it again because we're gonna write it to the ESP. I suppose I could have just rewound it and then passed it on. I didn't think about that, but <laughs> it wouldn't have been open for reading, so. I could change this to be a little bit better. But anyway, closing it, opening it again, adding it to this ESP file call. Um, other than that, elsewhere where I'm adding the boot x64 EFI file, again, I'm passing FP, I'm opening that. If it's locally, if it's not found locally, you can add it elsewhere as I just showed. For the ESP files, we're adding that. And for the info file, I changed some things for the basic data partition. So let me open that. Inside of adding the file to the data partition, I changed it to only make one file, not multiple, per each file added. So before it would make like file1.inf, file2.inf info files and add them to EFI boot in the ESP. Now it makes one overall file. So what I'm doing there is making this new data files.inf, you know, 8.3 naming constrained, of course. And if it's the first file I'm adding to the ESP, I have this Boolean. I'm setting it off, so only the first time it runs through and adds a file, it's gonna open it for writing, which will truncate it and start writing a new, else it'll open for appending and add to the end of the previous data. So if we add two files to the data partition, the first time we'll just open it, truncate it, and write info for that file. The second file we add would be appended after that point, right? And for each file, I change to just add the same info, the name, size, and LBA with a new line, so we can separate, if we have two files, it'll say 
the first block will be like for the kernel. The second one might be for a data file, but they'd both be in the same data FLS, the INF file here. And we're going to write that and get the next OBA. That's all the same. So at the end where I'm adding the data files, I could do this better where I don't have to repeat myself, but I'm just getting the new, the new path and name for that data files INF again. We're opening it and I'm adding that to the ESP, right? So that was some changes since last time as well. And the only other ones I can remember right now are adding a four kilobyte align sign to align size to work with uh, some other tools better. So it looks different in the file system as well. So before, if you're on Windows or Linux or wherever really, your files should be saved to the next page size or block size on your block device that you're saving this to, your hard drive, your SSD, whatever. Um, but the actual physical size of the file would be less than that. Right now, I changed it to where those are going to be equal. If it's if you have a 4K block size, it's going to make it 4K aligned. I guess if you're on like a Mac, if this even runs on a Mac, uh, they use 16 kilobyte pages. So this might not necessarily be true in all situations, unless it's 16K divisible, which by default would be 4K divisible. So we'll see. Anyway, I'm getting the current size up to this point. I'm getting it to the next... 4K align size by subtracting what it needs to go to that from the current. Either the current size is at a 4K boundary or it's a little extra than a 4K boundary. So this gets the difference to that, gets the last 4K aligned boundary for the size and then adds 4K to get the next 4K align size value. So that's all this is doing for the new size. And then I had to add a byte because if you F seek to a position and you don't write to it, the disk doesn't physically expand to that size, at least what I've seen on Windows and Linux. So I needed some value or some number of bytes to write to the image to expand it first. So that's what I'm doing here. If we add a VHD, the VHD itself takes up a certain size, 512 bytes. So really I have to get to where we want the file to end up at minus the size of that because it's going to be written. And then I moved one extra byte before that because I have to write this byte in order to seek and have it actually expand the disk. So. I'm writing a singular byte to bring it up to the point at which we can write the VHD, which will then bring our file size up to the next 4K line size here. A little complex, but not too much. So that's all I changed for the VHD footer. If we're not adding a VHD, there's an else condition now where we're just going to the new 4K size minus one because I write the one byte here. And that effectively expands the image to the next 4K line size. Um, the image size may have been different at this point, so I just moved this. It was up here somewhere. But I just moved this block of code down here as the last thing we do to add the disk image info file because the disk size would have been off. Now it has a new size here, so I'm setting that and calling it. So what does that all mean? It means this file size probably used to be uh, some amount of bytes less. This is a 4K align size. On your drive, this will be the same as the physical location, the physical size on the disk. It should be the same, but that's just as an example. And for a VHD option, it should do the same. You know, this will end up as the same size because it would be minus 512, and then it writes the 512 bytes. So hopefully this works under most or all situations, but anyway, there's that. So the data files, if you want to see that, if we want to write files to the data partition, let's say, I'm going to add to the ESP under EFI boots, just as an example, and where I've been testing for UEFI stuff, we'll add the boot x64 under there and to the data files, just to show that we can use short or long names here, I will add uh, a kernel file. So let's say we are working with a kernel, and I actually don't, it's probably in here, isn't it? Yeah, let's say we're working with a kernel here. I don't know if this is going to work. Maybe it'll work. Let's say we have a PE file. We could use an ELF as well. I was messing with that. But let's say we have a PE file. For a kernel, we add it to the data partition. So I add the bootx64, so the EFI bootloader, or EFI application, should be added to the ESP. It should add the kernel to the data partition from this path. It'll add files describing what that file is in the data partition and the overall disk image. So if I run QEMU, and again, this is sort of a sneak peek on things. We should have a kernel in the data partition, which I can load. It gets everything. Right now I have it to grab a, a keystroke before it goes on. But this is just showing for data that I printed out in my EFI application, I grab the data file, 
that was written to the ESP. I find the kernel within that data file. Um, I'm founding, I'm getting block IO protocols. I found a PE file for the kernel. So as the MZ signature, I'm getting relevant info. I'm loading the sections here and then I get the entry point and I jump to it. So I get a keystroke, I jump to the kernel. This is blinding, but all the kernel does is take in a frame buffer and writes a square to the screen. So that's just proving I can write to the frame buffer different colors, right? So what I'm trying to prove with that, which is kind of up in the air, you're like, am I supposed to believe this snake oil? I don't see the code behind it, but <laughs> I'm just trying to prove we can add multiple files and the data partition's different and all that's sort of in place now. So we have VHDs. Um, I've been told that that doesn't work under everything, although I believe it does, but I can attempt to show that here and dissuage. I don't know what the, the actual word is there, but uh, assuage your fears, something like that. Let me go to my image creator thing here. Just for VHDs, Linux doesn't care. You can mount whatever, right? But for, for Windows, I have a mount option. It says it's not initialized because we have an ESP. If I go to disk management, it does show up in here, but for Windows, they have documentation that explicitly says on their on their site that uh, they're not going to show the user ESPs, so EFI system partitions. They're not going to show that to you. They're not going to allow it to be messed with or added to a drive letter. They only allow basic data partitions. That's why we see this healthy basic data partition. It'll be mounted under this E drive here. Okay, what does that even mean? Doesn't matter. I'm just going to detach this for now. That was uh, one sole reason. Let's say I'll open PowerShell here. That was one sole reason that I made the PowerShell script. So I'm using Windows Terminal, but yeah, I'll use I'll use PowerShell just for the sake of argument. We'll run that as admin. It's just it's small. Can I increase the text the text size? I can't, can I? Okay. Well, maybe I'll zoom this in and post. <laughs> If I can spell, which I can't. Uh, all right, so mount VHD, I'm gonna run that. That's gonna take our VHD, it's gonna mount it. If you wanna use PowerShell, just showing that it does mount on Windows. It'll mount it under X by default, and we can go into it and we can work with it, right? This is the disk image file, that's the size. It'll pause there, I can press enter, it'll go back, okay. So if you want, if you don't want to use PowerShell, you want it to work like with this part or disk management, but you want it to actually be mountable for the ESP and give it a drive letter, you do have to make some small changes. And that is where the partitions are being laid out under write GPTs. So the ESP GUID is the partition type, the, the GUID. And if Windows sees that, it won't allow it to be mounted, right, under a drive letter. They say you can use other tools. We only allow basic data partitions. So if you take this and you make it a basic data GUID, it will still work. It will still um, it will still boot up if you put the boot x64 EFI file into here. But Windows will be able to see it and mount it. So I make this again and write a VHD file. The difference now is that we have a different partition type GUID for that partition. So uh, I don't have it open under here anymore, do I? Nope, okay. All right, so if I go to my folder, I get the VHD, I try the right mount again, the right click mount again. It actually doesn't do anything, so I probably messed up. <laughs> oh, I'm in my other one, that's why. <laughs> I was in my testing for UEFI, sorry about that. That wasn't even the right one. This is the right folder. I don't have all the changes in the other one, of course. Test VHD, okay. So if you, don't, if you don't believe me, that's the file I just made, but it's mounted and it works. So I'll just eject that. I'll do it again just to show you. I changed the GUID to basic data GUID as you saw. I'll just make the file again. I'm gonna remove the VHD so we know it's not there messing things up. Right, it's not in this folder. Right, B doesn't do anything. Right, V does, <laughs> it makes the VHD. So we have this VHD here, it is 1122. The right click mount, it works, you can go in and you can mount it. If you don't wanna use the PowerShell script, this will work. 
And this is the same on Windows 10 as well as 11. I've checked it on my laptop. I can provide footage here if I want to do that, but it works the exact same way. Okay, hey, I'm just popping in, splicing in here. If it's a little disjointed and not well put together, uh, apologies. <laughs> I just figure I wanted to show one more thing. One more thing, Jackie. Uh, Jackie Chan Adventures references notwithstanding. I wanted to show OSF mount because I have people that use that and want it to work with that. And I want to show that it does work with that uh, with or without setting the partition type here, so I'm just gonna move that back to what it was. Windows, of course, will not mount it under drive letter unless this is a basic data GUI, but I'm gonna move it back. So, just for the sake of argument, because that's what's in the repo right now, I wanna make sure it's all pristine and remove the VHD, so. For OSF mount, I found it just, for me, it's working better with just the regular HDD files, not the VHD. Um, also, one other thing I changed in there was when we add the fixed add the fixed VHD footer, if I opened it uh, within Windows with the right-click mount, it was adding 512 bytes. So actually, we need to say the size of the image without the VHD, and that's what I am doing here. I took off the plus 512 on this line here. So for full disclosure, that's the only change I've made, <laughs> and uh, I'll update that in the repo after this is recorded. But anyway, for this part here, uh, we have the test HDD file, right? We have that there. So if you want to use this tool, OSF mount. Let's try that again. <laughs> I forget all the permutations that I have to go through to make these things work, unfortunately. Oh, okay. Let's do logical, not physical, right? We're still doing direct, but we're doing logical. I don't know why, it does take a little longer to notify applications when it's created and destroyed, but Logical gives it a drive letter. It's read-write, so we can go into there. Let's say we make a file. I'm not sure if it has to be all caps or not, but I'm gonna make it all caps, right? We'll just write test, and we'll write a line test. So this should show up in the ESP under EFI boot, right? I'm just making sure it's there, so I'm gonna dismount it now. So that we can do it. Cannot lock the device. Do you want to try to force dismount? I'm not using it there. You should be able to do that. Am I in it? I'm in it on this window. Let's get rid of that window. <laughs> if you lock the file, well, you have a file lock and it can't remove it. Okay, dismount. The only reason I'm doing that is because uh, we need it dismounted for the files to work. Let's check for the HDD drive and KeyMu. And we'll run the bat file for L Windows. Go to the file system, go to EFI boot. Hey, we have that test.txt file, it's there. So you can add, you know, it's readable and writable. I just, I didn't show that before that you can add files in there and they do show up because it is a FAT32 file system. So, okay, that's there. Now with I think it's due to the EFI system partition. So if we make that ESP GUID, I know I just said you don't need to do this, but but for Windows to mount it, you need the basic data GUID for the EFI system partition, right? So if I do that, and I'm gonna say this is specifically for VHDs right now, let's just say we make a VHD file there. I'll go into OSF mount and try it for a VHD. Just to have a difference, and it does recognize that as a VHD image. We'll get the ESP, we'll do physical drive emulation, not read only, but it does write cache, so I cannot set it. So it's not gonna write to the partition, 
and logical will be read only. So I recommend not doing this for VHDs and just do it for HDDs and then it works. If you do VHDs, do Windows uh, or do it through File Explorer is what I mean to say there. Do it through File Explorer because you can go to the mount and you can write files here. This is in the VHD file. Let's make another thing here. I'll call it test two. Actually, I am curious if it, um, can I delete that and redo it? I am curious if it counts it as like lowercase or uppercase in OVMF, right? So we do testing again. I'll put a new line there. I am curious, testing these things out. Okay, that's the VHD file. So let's change this again to VHD for QEMU. All right. And let's go into that file system. Hey, we have test.2. Okay, so it doesn't care if it's capital, but you can add files. I don't want to paste stuff. <laughs> you can add files in there and it does work and it adds it to the EFI system partition. All right, that's all I wanted to show. If you want to use OSF mount for mounting, uh, raw images for my stuff works better right now. It will mount VHD stuff, as, but possibly only as read only, or it'll use write cache and it won't actually affect the ESP. You don't want to use write cache. So use the raw images HDD, that's fine, or image, whatever you name it. Or if you don't want the hassle, use Linux where it doesn't give a crap and you can just do what you want with your stuff because it respects your freedoms a bit more. In my opinion, Windows is grading on me a bit more these days from work and stuff anyway. Or you can just not go through OSF mount and use Windows directly. But that's just this little part that I wanted to splice in here. So I'll go back to the regular portion now. Sorry for <laughs> uneven editing and recording stuff, but yeah. And that would be three different options for Windows if you want to mount it. Linux doesn't really care. If I go under Linux, then again, I have the mount scripts for Linux mount image. Mount image Linux, this is a VHD file. So if I want to do that with VHD, um, it guessed raw and that's all right. Do I have it under the mount point? I do, it'll be under mount P1, we'll have EFI. And you know, you can mess with your stuff there, right? So it says everything that's in there. Um, Linux doesn't really care as much again, but anyway. When you're done with that on Linux, you can run unmount and it should unmount everything. So our mount point, that's not there anymore. All right, but I just wanted to show you can mount under Windows and Linux and it does work. So in a roundabout way, did I cover everything in this? I, I hopefully covered everything new as far as adding the files and the differences. Um, if you saw the file paths would not have a slash at the end anymore, right? So see before you would add a slash. Now there's no slash, it just says it adds, it adds the file. I went over all that. I guess I didn't go over the data files having the extra line between them. I can show that if it's needed. This was the options change for the ESP. And that, so yeah, that went over everything. So I guess I could show if we add multiple files uh, to the data partition, what the data file thing looks like, right? Do I have that up here? So I'll add data files and I will not add the boot x64 so that that doesn't boot up. Let's add data files. Let's add a local file here. You know, license, right? So that would add license to the data partition and the kernel exe. So then we can look at these things within the file system. And we'll go to EFI, we'll go to boot. What do we have? We have the data files thing. So this specifies, again, since I can add multiple now, it'll specify both. First, the kernel at the data partition start at LBA 71680, it's this big in bytes. The license file is this large in bytes and it starts a little bit later at the next LBA. So within an EFI application, we can pick up this data and load it from the disk because we have the exact LBA that it's at for the disk. So I will be showing that partly in upcoming videos for the EFI applications, as you saw at the little sort of sneak preview thing earlier, but that's all I'm gonna do for this. Hopefully I'm done with uh, <laughs> all the disk image stuff. If there's something you see that's wrong or something you want added or changed, then feel free to open a pull request, right? Or bug report or something, if it's reproducible. 
But open a pull request, I'll look at it, or feel free to merge your changes. Um, don't feel free to merge, feel free to submit them to be merged, right? But that's all I'm gonna be doing with this for the GPT image. I'm gonna move on next to EFI applications proper. And we will try to start with getting strings and things. Let me just show that again. So I will add this under EFI boot. So as far as adding strings and things, like for this EFI application, we'll get user input to make maybe a little menu thing. I don't know if I'll do this exact setup because this code needs to be streamlined. It's not, it doesn't look great, but we can at least get in keys. We can show like, um, I don't think my T key works for info either, which is funny. I broke that, but <laughs> um, we can at least use a menu and go through things. We can get timers. So we have an accurate one second timer. We can set different text and graphics modes, which all this does is change the size of the screen. It doesn't change the text size, at least in emulation. On my laptop it does. If you set like a lower, a lower graphics mode, then the text would change, right? But I'm gonna set the default here. Or we can set a large number. If you wanna do 1080p, that's available. All this does is set the size of the screen, really. I'm gonna set it back here. Uh, but we can mess with string input and output. I made an installer option if you wanna to install to a disk, but I'm not gonna do that. And we'll start with strings, we'll get user input, we'll do resetting, which shut down, works through that. Um, and I guess I'll go from there, getting the memory map, loading a kernel, doing that sort of thing. If you wanted a minimum viable thing to just load up a kernel file and jump to it to work as a bootloader, it's not that much code. However, I will be going through a little bit more stuff as we go along and printing out info and putting you know, helper functions and things. So it'll be more than you need for a minimal example. I might also make a minimal example, but just keep that in mind, right? <laughs> and I'll try to go through different parts of the UEFI spec as far as being relevant for a bootloader application. But that will be coming up. Hopefully that sounds interesting or exciting enough. But uh, thank you for watching this GPT image stuff. I know it's taken a while. I'll try to have the OS application videos be more, uh, not shorter necessarily. They should be shorter, but more sectioned into their own parts like one part will be under over like string input and output or something right the one part will be over setting the graphics mode i figure that would be better for that instead of hodgepodging a bunch of stuff together for like two hours kind of not as easy to go through and digest so anyway that's what i'm thinking so far i'll try to catch you on that if you're interested but otherwise again thanks for watching greatly appreciate it i'll see you then and cheers drink more water <laughs> Thank you.